Welcome everyone. I'm Madeline Milka, APAX President and CEO, and welcome to APAX's Legislative Leadership Series. Today, we are proud to present our next installment in the series of discussions, a conversation about broadband access and the digital divide, an especially important issue during the pandemic we are currently facing. I want to thank the sponsors of today's panel, AT&T, Comcast, NBC Universal, Microsoft, and Verizon for their support of this important discussion and of APEX. Before we get to the conversation, it's my honor to introduce Congresswoman Grace Meng, who is joining us for opening remarks. Congresswoman Meng represents New York's sixth district, and she also serves as the first vice chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, otherwise known as KPAC. She's the first and only Asian American member of Congress from New York State and serves on the powerful House Appropriations Committee. Congresswoman Meng is a tireless champion for the entire AAPI community, and we appreciate her longstanding support of APEX. We are thrilled to have her joining us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Grace Meng. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Madeline, for the introduction and for the tireless efforts put forth by you and your team uh, on behalf of our AAPI community and um, in building bridges uh, amongst all our communities. Uh, I'm Congresswoman Grace Meng. I represent parts of Queens, New York, and I'm so honored to join you and our distinguished panelists for the APEX Legislative Leadership Series. Uh, on broadband access and the digital divide. Um, we are here today uh, in part to discuss current efforts to address broadband access for communities of color, including the AAPI community, for rural communities, and for low-income communities. And as Madeline said, it's such an important issue uh, on a regular day, but especially during this pandemic, uh, its importance has really uh, been heightened. Internet access that is affordable and accessible is a major issue that we must address urgently. Much like electricity helped spur economic growth in the 20th century, internet access promises to usher in an unprecedented era of economic growth in the 21st century. But everyone from urban to rural areas much have, must have access to this critical technology, especially during this crisis. Um, it is a means to access essential healthcare information, work from home, and provide an education to over 55 million students across our country. Yet we are seeing such disparities to this access, uh, especially in low income, rural and communities of color, and especially nowadays in relation to education. I myself am a, am a mom of two young boys in public school here in New York, and I personally understand the challenges that parents are facing during this pandemic as we are helping our kids to adapt to this new way of learning and trying to make sure that our kids are not falling behind. And for those of us who have reliable internet access at home and have sufficient number of devices, we are the lucky ones. Before the pandemic, you know, we've been working on this issue actually way before the pandemic. Uh, there were nearly 12 million students without internet at home, part of what they call the homework gap. And with seven in 10 teachers assigning online homework, these students in the homework gap faced an uphill struggle to complete online assignments. I remember one time when my kids were younger, I asked them to take out their textbook and they told me that they don't have a textbook, that the textbook is accessed via a link on a certain website. So, you know, many uh, kids across the country have been forced to seek out public spaces for free Wi-Fi connections or to forego completing their assignments. So now in today's COVID-19 pandemic world of sheltering in place, extended school closures, and online learning, this gap is more and more severe. In New York City, which has the nation's largest school system at over 1 million students, 
More than one in five households with school age kids lack broadband access. Without secure and reliable internet access in the safety of one's home, learning will stop. And this will lead to unimaginable long-term socioeconomic consequences. We cannot allow this gap to turn into a full-fledged learning gap. We must redouble our efforts to provide funding to close the digital divide. That's why I introduced the Emergency Educational Connections Act to disperse funds to schools and libraries to buy Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, routers, and internet connected devices. No children should be left out of their education because of a lack of internet access. In addition to my bill, I helped secure $31 billion in education funding within the CARES Act, including $13.5 billion for K-12 through funding to purchase technology and support online learning for all students, and over $14 billion for colleges and universities and students to purchase technology needs and defray other costs. The House has passed my bill twice in the HEROES Act and also the Moving Forward Act uh, to provide billions to the FCC's E-rate program. The Senate must act swiftly to pass the next coronavirus relief package. So as schools develop plans to reopen literally as we speak, I will continue to advocate to prioritize the health and safety of our students and ensure that teachers and staff have the resources that they need to deliver a safe and quality education to all students. And despite the many challenges we face, I'll continue to push for the highest funding level for the Emergency Educational Connections Act. The road to recovery will be very long for our nation and our families need all the help that we can provide. So I hope to collaborate with my colleagues and community groups to make sure that we build our communities better and stronger. Uh, I thank the panelists and the sponsors for today's event, uh, and I wish all of you good health, uh, safety, and, and happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Bang, for taking the time to join us today and for your remarks. I would like to now to introduce the moderator of our panel, Nisha Ramachandran. Nisha is a consultant and small business owner specializing in government relations and strategic advocacy for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. She works with a number of API leaders and organization, including APAX, where she is currently bringing these legislative leadership series panels to fruition. She previously served as a policy director for the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans and CAPA, where she shaped the coalition's policy priorities and oversaw their policy committees. Nisha is also an APEX alum and served as an APEX fellow in the office of Congressman Ami Vera. She currently serves on the APEX Alumni Association Board. As a reminder, for those of you who are joining us on the webinar, please put your questions in the Q&A chat box. And if you're joining us on Facebook, please put them on the com in the comment section. Nisha, I turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Madeline. I'm very excited to get to moderate this panel today. I'm gonna start with a just very brief introduction of our speakers, um, and then we'll get right into it. We've got a lot to cover, um, so we'll try and get as much in as we can. And as Madeline mentioned, please feel free to, to ask your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we'll start with uh, Beth Fujimoto. She's the AVP of Public Policy at AT&T. Um, we also have Chan Park, the Director of Congressional Affairs at Microsoft. Um, Albert Shen, Smart Communities and National Lead of Smart Airports at Verizon. Um, we've also got Linda Shim, Executive Director of External Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. And last but not least, John Yang, President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, which I should note is also a co-chair of the API Tech Table. Um, thank you all for, for joining us uh, at this conversation today. We're really excited uh, to have you all here. Um, let's just start really quickly with, you know, just about two minutes for each of you to quickly, you know, give an introduction of yourselves, your organization or company, and frankly, why, why you're here and why you care about the issue. Um, let's start with you, Beth. Thanks so much, Nisha, and thank you, APAX, for having all of us today. Really look forward to this discussion. Um, I'm a member, as Nisha mentioned, of our global public policy team at at and and my areas of responsibility include universal service policy, um, the government programs targeting broadband access issues that we'll be talking about today, both 
um, in terms of how do we get the physical availability of broadband where it doesn't exist today, as well as, you know, how do we help to make um, broadband services, you know, more affordable so that more people um, can avail themselves of the benefits um, of broadband that, um, that, that it brings to communities. Um, why is this important to the AAPI community in particular? Um, well, today there are about 2.3 million members of the AAPI community who live in poverty. And, um, you know, so uh, uh, subscribing to broadband would be a challenge for them just given, you know, their financial situations. Um, furthermore, there's about 1 million AAPI um, members of the community who live in rural areas where, you know, also as we'll be talking about a bit later today and as, um, Congressman Meng mentioned, you know, um, getting broadband availability there is a challenge. Um, so it, it's a it's a particularly relevant issue to you know our AAPI communities, and we look forward to talking about them with y'all today. Thank you so much. Awesome. How about um, let's go to Chan next? Great. Thanks, Nisha. Um, just again, thank you for having us as part of this. We are really honored and proud to be one of the sponsors here um, of this panel and, and I appreciate all the other my colleagues here joining us. I think it shows uh, not only the community support for this particular issue and trying to you know extend, expand, uh, develop the broadband access for not just the AAPI community but also the broader community. As Congresswoman Meng mentioned in this time of the pandemic, it's particularly acute in terms of the the gap that we're seeing, the digital divide. Um, and, you know, as a member of the Congressional Affairs team, we're very much engaged with policymakers uh, on the Hill, uh, as well as in the administration to try and push forward uh, broader access. Uh, I want to applaud Congresswoman Meng for uh, her bill. We support the bill, we support uh, the Senate counterpart and want to do whatever we can uh, to, to do our part. So I'll just leave it at that. We just are very, very uh, proud to be part of this. I would say the one thing that we are looking forward to having a further conversation about is as we discuss access and the broadband access issues. Um, I know part of the title of this event is the digital divide. <clears throat> and the digital divide that we see happening uh, or developing out there is not just about access and affordability, but then also about digital skills and the ability for students, parents, teachers, employers, employees to also access uh, digital skills once they actually have broadband. So we look forward to that conversation too. Wonderful. Um, Albert? Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, my name is Albert Shen. I'm with Verizon on the Smart Communities team. Uh, I'm the segment lead for National Smart Airports. Um, no, Verizon is gl uh, glad to be here as part of industry to really talk about this important issue for us. Uh, I'm out here in Dallas, Texas, and I have personally traveled to many rural parts of Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and have seen the digital divide in many of the rural communities here in the southern part of the U.S. So uh, because of the pandemic, it is a critical part of what Verizon's objective is to help solve the problem. Uh, we have deployed you know, over a million uh, devices to students, but a lot more work to do. Um, but I think the important thing for me personally, too, is, you know, connectivity for students, obviously, as the uh, students are trying to get back to school and we're all trying to stay busy, that uh, we need that access, especially in the underserved communities. I've seen zip codes here with uh, over 50% with no access. So you think about that as a country and that's why we're here. Uh, and most importantly, I think connectivity has actually exposed, you know, like you think of George Floyd is what happened. Without that kind of connectivity, we haven't exposed the systemic racism that has been happening. So at many different levels, uh, this is such a critical issue that uh, we're happy to be part of this conversation and hope to find some solutions actually move forward on this. So thank you. Thanks, Albert. Uh, how about Linda? Thanks, Nisha, and thank you to you and to Madeline and to Congresswoman Ming. And I'm really excited to be here with my friends and colleagues. Um, for those of you who don't know me, as Nisha mentioned, I'm Linda Shim with uh, Comcast NBC Universal. I'm with the external affairs team there. And one of my uh, roles at Comcast is to work with the API community to help build out national partnerships. So um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Comcast, NBCU, we're a media and technology company. And we're best known for our Comcast cable and internet services through our Xfinity products. 
NBC Universal, which includes our film and television studios and parks and Sky over there in, in the United Kingdom. So um, as many of um, our colleagues here have mentioned, you know, there's a lot of focus on um, internet connectivity right now, especially given the pandemic. And I think at Comcast NBCU, we certainly understand that having access to internet is a matter of equity and justice. So I think we understand that internet can be an important equalizer and can provide a level playing field for all individuals. So we um, definitely want to do our part in ensuring that people can connect. And, you know, you need the internet internet to apply for jobs, to do your homework, um, order food, and um, for many of our API communities, even to fill out your census form um, before September 30th. So we, uh, if the internet is out of reach, I think we understand that many doors will remain closed uh, to those folks. So um, I'm really excited to be here for this conversation because, you know, we're working hard to help close the digital divide and I'm looking forward to the conversation we're going to have to see what we can do certainly to close that divide within the API community. Thanks, Linda. And finally, John. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, uh, to be part of this panel. Wonderful to join my colleagues. Thanks to Apex, Nisha, and Madeline for setting this up. Uh, my name is John Yang. I'm the president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So we are a nonprofit organization that's based in DC. Our mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. So why we're interested in this is at bottom, we see this as a civil rights issue. Just as housing is a civil rights issue, banking is a civil rights issue, employment is a civil rights issue, technology and telecom is a civil rights issue. A, a number of our panelists have already alluded to this and we'll talk about this further about how this affects our community. And certainly we see this from the nonprofit civil rights angle that we need to be part of this conversation, need to be part of the solution. Great, thanks, John. And so let's, as we get into this, let's take a step back for a second. And John, based especially on what you just said, um, I wanna ask you if you can just set the stage a bit for us, um, you know, about why why this is an important issue, especially for, for API communities, um, and really frame it in terms of our communities and the digital divide, how that impacts us. Absolutely, Nisha. And maybe let me take even a step further back and think about when we talk about the digital divide, especially for people out there that are listening to this for the first time, what are we talking about? And I would segment this into three ways, right? One is access, one is affordability, and one is literacy. So at basic, you know, if the first question is, do you even have access to these services? Do you have the infrastructure in your area to have access to broadband, to have access to, to these types of technological services? As Beth mentioned, there's about a million Asian Americans that live in rural populations. And whether that's in rural California, that, whether that's in Hawaii, they might not even have access, right? Regardless of affordability. So that's question number one is how do we overcome that last mile type of issue? Then question number two is affordability. And again, Beth outlined this perfectly well as we have around at least 2 million Asian Americans that live in poverty, right? The numbers are actually probably much greater than that. Is there's this myth when it comes, especially when it comes to technology that Asian Americans that are affluent, they're already well connected, they are early adopters of technology. And some of that is true. Asian Americans are early adopters. If you look at the, the business side of things, you know, there's a business case to be made to appeal to Asian Americans. But the Asian American community is a barbell. You know, on one end, you have people that are very affluent, well-educated, speak English well. On the other end of the barbell is a number of people that live in poverty, that don't have access, that, that have limited English proficiency. So it's making sure that that other end gets served. And so that is through that affordability piece. And the last piece to digital divide that Chan mentioned is with respect to what we would call literacy. All right, even if you could afford a computer, even if you have access to the internet, can you use it? Can you use it effectively? And again, here, the Asian American community, about a third of us are limited English proficient. English is not our first language. It is not a language that is fluent in our household. And so how, if, even if we have a computer, are we able to use it for education? Are we able to use it to pay bills? Are we able to use it to find a mortgage, to find our next job, right? So how it affects our community, it affects it at all three of those levels and in those different ways that we talk about. So when we talk about policies, you know, first we have to make sure we understand which piece we're talking about. And second is 
how it's affecting our communities with respect to that specific piece. Thanks, John. John, I know you also have some some additions here. Would love to hear from you, especially uh, around broadband mapping. Can you can you explain a bit more about what that means and why that's important? Yeah, thanks, Nisha. I mean, I just it and frankly just builds on what John was just saying, and frankly, um, Congresswoman Meng's remarks too. I mean, her analogy to electricity. Uh, and the need for broadband access to sort of the new electricity that harkens back in some ways to you know efforts in the 1930s and 1940s for rural electrification, and the idea behind that partly was to not only get electricity out there, but the first step was trying to figure out frankly where you had electricity where you didn't, and that's I think something that we need to do more accurately now as well is get a sense as to where folks actually have access to broadband and where they don't, where it's affordable and where it's not. The FCC you know, tries its hard, there's a lot of work being done, but you know, frankly what we've seen is there's a need for more funding to get accurate mapping data uh, for you know, where there actually is broadband access. And what we've seen, there's a report I think from the FCC that talks about you know, 21 million Americans not having access to broadband. We've seen a report recently this year by a nonprofit indicating that the number is actually 42 million, so twice more than twice that. And then our own data, Microsoft's data, shows that in terms of usage, uh, there's more than 150 million people, 157 million people, I think, by our estimate, that don't actually use internet at broadband speeds, which is kind of the combined population of eight of our biggest states. And so, you know, there's a disparity sometimes between what um, you know, folks seem to think is broadband access versus the reality. I mean, I'll take Congresswoman Meng's district as an example, where by our data, you know, it looks like about maybe half people in um, Congresswoman Meng's district are able to use internet at broadband speeds, whereas the FCC or government data indicates that 100% have access. Those might actually be similar or, or accurate statements in the sense that there's quote unquote access, but in terms of who's actually using it and who has the you know, ability to afford it and access it, um, there's a disparity there. And I'm sure when it comes to communities of color, when it comes to the AAPI community, those disparities are even greater. And so it's just one point I wanted to make in terms of before, or as part of the process of trying to address this issue, as part of the process of tackling this really, really, you know, frankly, widening gap um, and digital divide, we have to have the data, we have to have the, the accurate numbers to to really figure out where to address and, and tackle the problem. And Nisha, if I might jump in, um, I mean, you know, Chan's absolutely right that we need more accurate data. Um, you know, I think um, the FCC is doing a lot, right, to improve um, the broadband availability maps and um, just like to sort of put boundaries on, you know, the, the numbers we're talking about. Um, according to the FCC's most recent data, about 98% of people in urban areas have access to broadband speeds. In other words, you know what, um, I think, you know, and sorry, I'm gonna get a little bit technical here, but you know, 25 megs down, three megs up, like that, that's kind of table stakes today, right? Um, so about nine, okay, according to their data, about 98% of people in urban areas have access to 25 down, three up speeds. Um, but only about 78% of people in rural areas have access to these speeds. So it's very much an urban rural divide I I issue. So that, that would equate to about like 16, 17 million Americans, which, you know, as Chan is highlighting, you know, we know is very likely to be some, somewhat north of that, right? Um, but the really important thing that Chan highlighted, and John, you are also absolutely right in terms of, you know, identifying that there are availability issues of where broadband is physically available versus, you know, are people actually using it and subscribing to it. Um, the good thing is that Congress earlier this year passed the Broadband Data Act, which, um, which the president signed into law. And what this would do is create a nationwide inventory, essentially of every physical location, every home, every small business um, that is or should be serviceable by broadband. And, and then lay, using that information, which you know, frankly doesn't exist for these purposes today, you know, providers would then layer on, okay, where are they serving? What locations are they capable of serving? And at what speeds? so that once and for all, we will know exactly which locations do not have broadband 
and we can target funding mechanisms to get broadband there. Um, we won't need to guess anymore. We won't need to rely on predictive models, as is the case today. Um, so this is critically important. And while the Broadband Data Act was enacted earlier this year, um, Congress has yet to fund it. And so, um, you know, as, as Chan was saying, you know, it's absolutely important that um, funding be directed to implement the Broadband Data Act. Um, there are measures pending, um, I think, moving in both houses of Congress that would um, get the FCC the money it needs to, to address um, the mapping need. And, you know, we would urge Congress to, to appropriate the money so that the FCC can proceed. Thanks, Beth. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've heard a lot, especially, you know, in talking about the pandemic, we know this work has been, has been ongoing since longer than that, but especially right now, you know, Congresswoman Meng mentioned um, folks across the country going to school, you know, kids going to school remotely, um, many of us included, you know, working remotely, um, an increase in everything from telehealth and just about everything else going remote, this need for a reliable internet connection being, you know, even more crucial for everyone than, than it may have even been in the past. Um, so, a question for all of you, you know, in terms of the basic issues, we started to cover some of this um, when it comes to access, uh, you know, what those are. We talked a little bit about kind of a rural and urban divide and how um, if we can get a little more into that would be would be great to hear about. Um, and then it, maybe even more importantly, especially for um, some of you folks from from some of the on the corporate side, uh, what what are your companies doing to to address or try to bridge this gap? Happy to start with anyone that wants to go. Yeah, happy to jump in there on two things. One, um, yeah, I, by, by 2021, Verizon does plan to disperse another 2 million devices to students because the need is just increasing with the pandemic. Uh, secondly, I think as an industry, uh, we want to also talk about in terms of why it's so difficult. I think every carrier that's here uh, definitely wants to bridge the divide. I mean, the need is there, the technology is there, and the means and method is clearly there. So um, I used to, in my earlier part of my career, I used to put up cell towers for one of the big carriers. And at one point I was managing 150 different sites. That's 100, 150 different building permits, each with its unique design and zoning criteria in 150 different jurisdictions. So I think part of the industry we all need to solve, you know, with local government is because everyone is so unique in their, in their zip codes is to find some sort of common standard when it comes to uh, deploying the technology too. Because like I said, it's not difficult technology, it's just getting it into those areas has, is, I think has been challenging for the industry overall. So I think the other part of that conversation for us, we all want to work together in working with local government is how can we best get, you know, antennas, get cable, get fiber, all the hard infrastructure in order to get broadband and wireless services out to those communities. So, um, so that's another part, I think, in the overall solution package that we want to dive into as this conversation continues. And as I think as this continuously evolves during the pandemic, it'd be very challenging. But um, so yeah, so that's, I think that's one of the things we want, definitely want to be part of that conversation. Thanks. Sure, and Albert's absolutely right. Um, you know, the expanding the availability of high quality broadband services has been a national goal for several years now, right? Since um, Congress directed the uh, creation of the National Broadband Plan, which was done in 2010. Um, you know, progress has most definitely been made to get services where, um, you know, a commercial business case um, for deployment is lacking due to the economics of serving, um, you know, sparsely populated areas. Um, you know, and, and this is through programs like the FCC's Connect America Fund and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Reconnect Broadband Deployment Program. Um, but, but clearly, as the pandemic has highlighted, you know, it's just not enough. Um, it, it, what, what, what we're seeing as a result of the pandemic, of course, is that um, many Americans just don't have, you know, the uh, broadband service they need to be able to to work from home and do virtual learning. Um, and, you know, it, it may be not that long ago even that people in rural areas, um, you know, it was okay for them to rely on dial-up service or satellite or, you know, their mobile 
helpful is just to check email or whatever, but you know, that is clearly inadequate when video conferencing um, is the standard for all work in all schools. Um, and so for that, from that perspective, the FCC is soon going to be auctioning $1.6 billion a year um, through in universal service funds to support new rural broadband deployment over the next 10 years. Um, but that investment is just not enough to get, um, you know, service out as quickly. I mean, families just can't wait 10 years, um, you know, to get service if they lack it today. Um, so, you know, the, the bottom line is you know, the FCC has the right mechanisms, we think, to get um, broadband to places that don't have it today where, you know, commercial business case is lacking. Um, but the big problem is that the Universal Service Fund, which funds these programs, um, relies on a funding mechanism that's already imposing, um, you know, close to a 30% tax on all telecom purchases by consumers and businesses. Um, so there's just not a lot of headroom, you know, for the USF to grow, and it's going to take decades then, you know, at those levels to connect all Americans um, if all we're willing to spend is $1.2 billion a year. Um, we just cannot wait that long. The need is too urgent. So, um, you know, we recommend that Congress um, step up and appropriate the roughly 80 to $100 billion that would be um, estimated, you know, would be needed to get the job done quickly to get broadband to all Americans once and for all. Um, the FCC has the right structure and F expertise to do it, and they just need the funding to get, get, get the job done. And Nisha, I just wanted to quickly build on what Alver and Beth just mentioned. I know they were talking um, about deployment. I just wanted to touch on adoption as well, just real quick during um, the pandemic and especially what I think many of our companies have seen. Um, I, I don't want to speak for all for speak for all, but for us, at least over at Comcast, you know, when the pandemic started and, you know, businesses and schools started shutting down in March, we uh, went ahead and put together a pretty aggressive uh, COVID response plan that also provided um, uh, free access to internet for low income families um, through our discount broadband internet program called Internet Essentials, which has been around for um, about 10 years, I think close to 10 years, and we've connected um, over 8 million um, uh, people so far since the start of the program. And what we've seen, as especially as we've been getting into certain communities and working hand in hand with school districts, especially as, you know, people are experiencing, you know, back to school season and a lot of schools are going to be uh, doing online learning for at least the foreseeable next few months. I know several people on this panel must be dealing with that as well. Um, one thing, especially because we have such a captive audience of people from the API community here, I think it's good to raise um, that we've seen language access be such a barrier, especially when we've gone into minority communities. There's, you know, where I think some school districts and, you know, working hand in hand with us are even going door to door to touch on families that are not responding to schools about how they can sign up for internet and get their students online. And if you think about sort of how some of us may have also uh, grown up, you know, I know even coming from an immigrant household, I sometimes had to handle signing up for these types of services for my parents because they didn't, one, they couldn't think about what the internet even meant, but, you know, how do you even go about signing up for it? So I just wanted to put the practical problem out there, especially for other API organizations and um, community representatives that might be watching. I think there's, you know, I really want to kind of put out the call for help because we've, we've seen too, so many people who may have actually access to free internet, especially during this time to get their children on board, to get their families on board. But we've seen that uh, um, language access, especially being a barrier. So I hope we can talk about that a little bit more later. I know John touched on it a little bit, but I think that's um, a, a, you know, an area around adoption that I just wanted to flag for our API viewers. Thanks, Linda. Um, 
Do anyone else have anything they want to add? Um, on the issue of adoption, um, and this is a great place where, um, you know, I think, um, you know, it really takes a variety of solutions, right? Because I think all of the research on why people do not use the internet are not online, um, they all have a multitude of reasons, right? Um, some people like just find the internet not to be relevant to their day-to-day -day lives. There are definitely other people who, um, you know, um, you know, for the reason, like, like Linda highlighted, um, their affordability issues, right? Um, so there's really a variety of issues such that, you know, you, there isn't kind of like a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, what Comcast is doing with Internet Essentials is, you know, absolutely um, terrific. You know, it's been a really extremely successful program. Um, AT&T has a civil liberties round called Access from AT&T where, you know, we provide um, internet connections at very low cost. Um, but again, from the perspective that, you know, this is an issue that would take a variety of solutions. Um, you know, there's also a program out there called the Federal Lifeline Program, also administered by the FCC, um, that subsidizes um, voice and broadband service. Uh, the FCC expanded it to support um, broadband service um, several years ago, and so uh, participating families who have low incomes um, get a support amount of nine dollars and twenty-five cents, um, you know, to help them pay for the broadband and internet service of their choice. Um, but the program really hasn't met its potential in terms of helping to put broadband in reach of eligible families, and there are probably a re variety of reasons for that. One of the, that one of which is likely, you know, frankly, the discount amount, which I think people are starting to take a look at. Um, but a really big issue is that, um, you know, the the way that the benefit is dis delivered to participating households today um, is that um, p participating providers have to discount their bills and then get reimbursed from the Universal Service Administrator. Um, so the providers in the middle of delivering the discount to uh, participating consumers and then they then seek reimbursement after the fact. And so with millions and millions of dollars at stake for providers, um, you know, it, it's no surprise maybe that there's now, you know, a thicket of regulations around that, you know, to, to help safeguard against waste, fraud, and abuse from, you know, and there have been some really highly publicized examples of unscrupulous actors in the program. Um, not to mention, you know, from at and perspective, if, if we've got to discount the bill um, to reflect the lifeline benefit, then that means we need to know the fact that a consumer is participating in lifeline, right? Which means that we have to know that the consumer, you know, meets the income eligibility criteria. Um, we just don't think it's appropriate for private sector providers to be privy to that kind of sensitive um, information about consumers' households. Um, so we are recommending that the program be modernized um, to put the benefit directly in the hands of participating consumers, um, much like if you, if you all are familiar with the SNAP or SNAP Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, what, what the SNAP program does is it gets every participating household an EBT card that's like, you know, essentially like a reloadable prepaid card that they can then use, you know, to pay for the groceries of their choice. Um, by doing that, we think a lot of the regulations that, you know, frankly, maybe disincentives for provider participation um, would, would, could go away and, and therefore, you know, you'd incentivize more provider participation, um, making the program more attractive to providers and hopefully being more meaningful in meeting the needs of low-income consumers. And again, you know, it's, it's important to the AAPI community because there are something like 2.3 million AAPI households that, you know, are living in poverty today. So, you know, the Lifeline program can play a very meaningful role in helping to get service to families who can't afford it. But, you know, it's just not doing that under the present framework. Nisha, do you, can, I'd like to just add one thing to what Beth is also mentioning. I think um, the Lifeline program, um, it, you know, is serving low-income 
families now. And I think as you know, we've talked about sort of the impact of uh, the pandemic on our economy, you know, additional millions of Americans are gonna to continue to suffer, especially as the impact is fully realized in the next few months. I think something that we're also asking Congress to take a look at is whether or not uh, it makes sense to create an emergency broadband benefit that can, you know, sort of be a, um, you know, provide a subsidy to eligible customers and households that, you know, the temporary, it could be a temporary subsidy if they receive somewhere in the range of 20 to $50 a month to uh, purchase home broadband internet. We are certainly asking Congress to consider that. Um, I think the range of how many people are going to be suffering and at what income levels that will vary. And given the amount of API um, community members who own small businesses, we know they're going to be certainly impacted impacted um, and uh, will be feeling the hurt in the next few months. So I, I just wanted to add that uh, proposal in there as well. Yeah, if I can jump in one quick, just also a, you know, in, in real time right now on the ground, uh, we're seeing, I just talked to a local city government official. I mean, there is a sense of desperation right now, given the urgency of kids getting back into school right now, a very disparate strategy that's happening around the country. And some cities can't afford it. Some suburbs, su suburbs can, some cannot. And I'm seeing some interesting innovation. Uh, you know, one city here, I mean, they're looking at extending, I'm trying to find ways to help them extend Wi-Fi, you know, into a parking lot, you know, just so kids can drive up to the parking lot and do their schoolwork from there. So, uh, so there's a real time urgency, you know, that's going on right now. And I think, yeah, congressional funding will be critical in order to help companies like all of us deploy that kind of technology, because it has to be a partnership from that perspective. But, but I just want to highlight the fact that, you know, yeah, policy-wise, there's a long-term uh, long strategy, but in the short term, too, in order to get kids back into school urgently enough, you know, and, you know, and keep us all occupied is that, the, you know, there are some interesting creative uh, solutions. And, you know, part of our 5G strategy, too, is to help build that uh, foundation so that innovation can come in on top of the 5G to be able to enable those solutions so students can get access to the internet much quicker and from uh, from a wire wireless perspective too, so. Yeah, Nishik, just to piggyback on what my colleague was saying, <clears throat> not to add to the technical side of things, but more just in the broader perspective of AAPIs and the, the community interest in this. I mean, I think what you're hearing from all my colleagues, my, my company colleagues, not John necessarily, but John I think would agree that there is there is a role to be played by companies like AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, Microsoft, right? We have to play our part. We have to do what we can. I mean, like the internet essentials, amazing. AT&T's work, Verizon's work, terrific. Microsoft, we're trying to do our part when it comes to getting the right data, helping to inform deployment, helping to inform the map mapping. We have a tool we've developed. It's all well and good, and we, we're trying to do what we can on rural broadband. We have a whole airband initiative to try and get uh, rural broadband out to, to different communities, you know, and on the digital skills, we've, we've got work being done there too, which we can talk about later. But that is only part of it. And what I think you're hearing is that there's a role for the government to be playing, there's a role for funding, and there's a role, frankly, for the broader community to be jumping into this. Because as John alluded to, and I think as Congresswoman Meng alluded to, this is a real equity and civil rights issue when it comes down to it. And I think one of the important points I think that everybody would agree on is that in order for the AAPI community's voice to be heard, we have to make sure that we're part of these conversations. It's, it's fantastic that Apex has put this together. I really applaud you know, all the organizers for kind of shining a light on the broadband issue, the access issue. And that I think is incumbent on, on us as the panelists, but also a lot of the folks who, I mean, if you signed up for this, you're watching, you have an interest. And so it's incumbent on you as well to insert yourself in those, into those conversations um, and talk about or ask about, you know, even if you don't know the answer, ask about the AAPI perspective and ask about the data. You know, I don't think that frankly, a lot of the data that, that we're throwing around here has been disaggregated in terms of the Asian American community, ethnicities, um, I, I saw one report earlier this year where they talked about Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but even that wasn't really disaggregated. And so I think there's a lot more work to be done. And I think, frankly, you know, John's organization, other groups are out there pushing and pushing and pushing. Uh, it's also incumbent on those folks here as well as those watching to, to kind of help in that effort. Thanks. 
John, did you want to jump in? Sure, and let me jump in. And thanks, John, and everyone else. Because I, in terms of the work that needs to be done, I've seen a number of questions asking about resources, and that's part of it. Yeah, the challenge right now is for a lot of community organizations, the techniques they would have used to reach out and make sure people are connected are those door-to-door -door touches that aren't possible right now. So we have this double whammy that we're, we're dealing with. And by definition, the people that, that sort of we need to reach out to are people that we can't reach out to by cell phone, by text, uh, or any of these devices, because that's what they're trying to see. So I think that's the challenge. So for the people that are watching this that are interested, part of it is literally it might be just connecting with whether it's my organization, organization like OCA, JCL, that are doing work in this area to sort of figure out for your geography, right? And, and I, you know, maybe I'm going to be in politics. I'm an, I'm a neutral broker. I, you know, I work with all of the partners here, right? Uh, and, and I don't have any stake in the game, so to speak, as to who you use. But I, I could tell you, all right, here's the map, right? Here's the here's the company that served your geography, and, and I can connect you guys with the right right representatives in that geography. Many of these companies, you know, whether it's Comcast, AT and T, Verizon. They already have multilingual materials that they're happy to push out to community organizations if they know who to talk to, right? So that's sort of the, the barrier. And that's part of what organizations like mine are trying to do. But whether it's individually or through this tech table that Anisha alluded to is there are so many gaps that we're dealing with, right? It's just a basic understanding gap. There's the gap between our community, that limited English proficient community that doesn't even know how to talk about it. So we're trying to serve in some ways as a representative to help them to talk about it to our industry partners. But then on the flip side is helping to educate our community about the importance of all of this and what they can do about it. Because, you know, just like we saw with PPP, to use a different analogy, many Asian small businesses didn't apply for loans or didn't know how to apply for loans. We see some of that happening here with respect to a number of these types of low cost internet broadband programs that companies are offering is they don't know how to access them, right? So we need to educate our communities about how to do that. So if anyone is interested, connect with any of us here, we can help you start that process of, of educating. The last piece I would emphasize uh, that Chan and I think Beth alluded to as well is, you know, the data we have is so incomplete. Uh, and, and that's somewhere, that's a place that all of us need to do more work. It's certainly incumbent on organizations like mine, as well as our industry partners to help put this together, is the data just generally on Asian Americans is incomplete and uh, insufficient and oftentimes misleading, right, in terms of adoption rates, in terms of usage rates. But then there's, I think, almost none. I can't think of any one disaggregated study of how our communities are using broadband, adoption rates, access rates, literacy issues, right? We need to do more studies on that. I mean, I have my own hypotheses, right, as to what communities are underserved. But, but we need to understand that better. I think that would benefit everyone. Thanks, John. Um, I, and I wanna actually go back a little bit. I know we heard from a lot of the folks on the, the corporate side, um, but especially in terms of, you know, um, AAJC being one of very few national Asian American API organizations with dedicated capacity, dedicated resources um, to these types of issues. Um, can you talk a little bit in terms of, you know, the, we, we touched a little bit on the, the API tech table and having this coalition of organizations that AJC co-chairs, um, like really the importance of that kind of work happening at the community, you know, whether it's the national organization level or otherwise, and also, you know, the the importance of working with, um, you know, like, uh, as you mentioned, industry partners. So some of the folks represented on this call, um, particularly around broadband and COVID-19, but in general, kind of the way that that works and why that's important. And the role sure. that the plays. Sure, thank you. And, and so this tech table that Nisha alludes to is only about two and a half years old. And it was came from this recognition that there's an emerging need, emerging need in the Asian American community to better understand where the gaps are with respect to technology in the Asian American community. And I always think of it as a two-way street. One is to educate our community itself 
you know, many of the grassroots organizations that, that probably are represented on this call or watching this call to understand sort of where these gaps are, what we could do about them, what existing infrastructure exists uh, and help them to advocate for themselves. And then on the flip side, get information about them for what, what the gaps are. And then we as a tech table could reflect that to our industry partners, many of whom are on, on this Zoom, right? Is that here's what we're hearing from our community. Sometimes it could be very micro as in this one community, we've been gotten reports that, uh, you know, that, that the service there has been bad, has, has not been focused on the Asian American community. We could bring that to an industry partner and we could work on a micro level. But just as importantly as those, these macro issues, right, is if you're talking about providing emergency broadband benefits, which we agree is so essential in this time of COVID-19, what does that look like in terms of getting that out to the community? Will the federal government be funding translation so that our community understands that these benefits are available? You know, what, and sort of how will we integrate that with what the industry partners are doing in terms of making sure that they have these materials that are available that get pressed out into the community uh, and, and where the pockets are that are most needed, right? And so that's what, you know, we spend a fair bit of time thinking about and trying to work on. You know, at that national level, it's, it will be some of this legislation was well, represent Maine's legislation. It's like the Heroes Act, uh, and then at a more micro level, working with the individual industry partners to to help implement that in a way in a way that's that's very smart. And it's a long term game, right? Because again, just like all of these other industries I've talked about, whether it's banking, finance, etc., we have to think about it in that way as well. Because otherwise, we're just going to be left behind. I mean, it's as simple as that. Thanks, John. Um, one of the things that, that came up, you know, as we've been talking and prepping for this call uh, is around, especially right now, um, the private, the work happening between the private sector and, you know, local and state governments. Uh, I know, Linda, you had some thoughts there if you want to share about the value of public-private partnerships. Yeah, of course. And I think many of our um, sort of messages today is talking about what Congress, you know, what what help we we need them to execute on. Um, and Congresswoman Ming uh, spoke a little bit about um, sort of what she's been trying to do. But I think, you know, obviously that work has been slow coming in a sense. Um, so we've sort of we dove right in to start working with local cities, local school districts. I think I talked a little bit about, you know, um, as the con as the Congresswoman mentioned the homework gap and ensuring that students right now are getting connected to the internet uh, for online learning. So for us, other than, you know, making our IE program free for 60 days to new customers at the start of uh, COVID that I touched on earlier, we also started uh, collaborating with um, more than 70 school districts and cities throughout the country in order to uh, what we now call uh, create the uh, Internet Essentials Partnership Program. And really, we're just trying, we try to create this program to accelerate internet adoption during this uh, super critical time. So we have worked with large cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Atlanta, to smaller cities in um, a number of different states in order to bring together uh, not only, you know, city funds, but also uh, help from philanthropists in the area and um, uh, community impact funding from us as well to provide discounted um, internet or if not free internet for students in some of these cities. So, you know, I just uh, really wanted to point out how many of us, I know other companies are doing very similar work, uh, are trying to fill the gap while we're still waiting for, I think, the federal government to take more action to ensure that, you know, families have the resources that they need and the state and local cities have the resources that they need to address this critical problem. One other, one other suggestion too, and maybe sort of a self-imposed call to action. I mean, there's also industry groups too, like CTIA and other business groups that, you know, we're all part of. And I think, and we've had those conversations. So it's the amount of bringing up the awareness, you know, of the disparate communities, Asian American, African American, Latino, and elevating that conversation. So, I mean, those, those are continuous and it seems to be a legacy conversation. Um, but I think upon us and during this pandemic, it's important that, you know, we take the step to, you know, elevate it and 
bring more visibility on the disparity of so many of these communities, especially the API community that has seen this incredible disparity and just simply access the internet. I mean, it's all dependent on our mobile device. That's where we spend all our time. We've all seen our screen times increase exponentially uh, during the pandemic, but, uh, but in terms of for ed kids' education, uh, and I think there is that connection here that we can all make as we participate in these virtual industry groups and bring upon that awareness. So, um, so I'm putting that on myself too as well. So, so we're gonna we're gonna start to move into some of our audience Q and A um, in our last twenty-ish minutes that we've got uh, here. One of the things I know we talked about a little bit. I know there were some questions around resources, and so thanks, John, for addressing some of that. Um, already uh, certainly would welcome if anyone else has anything else they want to share around um, resources from from your respective companies, um, particularly language access. I know for non English proficient folks was uh, or limited English proficient folks was something that came up. Is there anything anyone else wants to add there? Yeah, I'm happy to add something real quick because I feel like I've been a commercial for our interstitials program today, but we do have uh, resources in uh, several different languages, including API languages as well. And even for that program alone, we work with, um, I believe, I'm forgetting the exact number at the moment, but hundreds of partners throughout the country, like partner organizations that are directly working in the communities that we're trying to help and you know they receive our IE toolkits as well to ensure that they're receiving the in-language materials that they can also use um, you know some of our partners also include service centers so you know I think even within the API community we're all very familiar with the Chinatown service centers the um, other um, service centers that are located um, in our uh, minority enclaves so um, please feel free to reach out if I can be helpful in getting any of that information to you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think we're really seeing the struggles, especially within our immigrant uh, communities right now. So uh, definitely want to figure out how we can be a better resource for those of you who are especially working on the ground. And is there another, is it, should, should folks, if they're interested, get in touch with you or are there, is there a, a link or something that they should be visiting? On the website, we, we're happy to send that out in the chat if you're able to get that over to us. But um, is there another way they should do that? Linda. Yes, I can get you the link as well. <laughs> okay, great. we'll send that out in just a minute. So. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Uh, a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, any advice for Asian Americans working in telecoms or related industries? How do engineers or project managers or consultants at the beginning of their careers bring an API slash civil rights perspective to advanced connectivity issues? It's open for anyone. This is an interesting one because, uh, you know, and obviously this is a little bit more specific, but I think historically you've had a lot of entry level Asian employees that come from immigrant backgrounds that don't understand the civil rights history here in the United States. And there was this disconnect, right? So that they, in some ways, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say they weren't part of the community, but they didn't understand some of these types of issues that we're talking about. I actually think that that has changed in the time of COVID-19, in part because of the racism that all of us have felt, in part because of sort of the connection that all of us felt in this moment. I've actually done a fair number of discussions with ERG groups um, and you know this issue has come up um, yeah I think I did one for Verizon I did one for Comcast for my, my industry partners out there uh, and this is I, I think we're at a this is a nice moment for nice is not the right word but it, it's an opportunity right for for us to sort of have those discussions with our ERGs have those what people call courageous conversations about all right you know in this moment Sort of let's connect all of the dots here and help those employees understand this better and think about their own role. And there's so many different roles that can be played by these employees in the civil rights struggle, in sort of this uh, structural racism that that clearly we are all facing. So I you know I encourage the ERGs at all of our companies to do do more here and, and to do this because it, it, their employees I think are asking for it. They're they're yearning for it. 
Yeah, actually, I think uh, it, just to tag it, exactly, the ERGs are a great segue. And we've seen, at least I've seen, a national movement of new AAPI ERGs emerge from many different sectors and industries uh, through different organizations or their own created. Even the tech sector have created their own type of ERG group because of the API hate crimes and discrimination that was happening. So it really has energized, I think, a corporate level of employees of APIs who are grappling to understand, you know, the civil rights history uh, and actually the diversity of APIs within our community too as well. So, um, so it's been encouraging to see this coalition building across all that together. But it'd be great to have amongst you know of us here in this in this room to build our own you know coalition and grow it in terms of on this exact issue. So I think that would be a, a great next step eventually. So. so can I just jump in just to translate corporate speak because I'm pretty new to this and for folks who don't know ERG I, I believe is Employee Resource Group or something like that, sort of an affiliation or affinity group of sorts. I didn't know that till recently. So just flagging for those who may be watching who are also like me, sort of newbies to the corporate world. John clearly knows the lingo. Uh, same here, John. I only learned it a year ago when I also joined the corporate world. So I too am still learning the acronyms, but uh, along the lines of what John mentioned and what I'm building on what Albert said, I think ERGs can be really powerful um, communities. Where, I mean, where you can go and find community, but also can speak with one voice. I think um, because John just mentioned the Antasian, um, uh, incidents that have been occurring during the pandemic, you know, for our company as well, not only to, you know, address the need that we see in the community, but also to be responsive to our APA ERGs that are, you know, located in different uh, markets throughout our country. Um, we, you know, um, invested in um, creating um, a or putting together an API town hall through NBC Asian, Asian America to talk about these issues. John spoke on that panel, Congresswoman Ming also spoke on that panel, but we wanted to give, uh, provide a, a convening where we can talk about these issues more broadly to the public. And we also uh, provided some resources to other API organizations that were doing work in that arena so that you know they can create websites that can be a resource to the general public, collect um, data on the number of incidents that were going on throughout the country and I think part of that was really to show our ERGs that our company was also paying attention to what was happening within their communities and uh, show them that we cared and how we can address some of those problems. Thanks. Um, we've got one another question. Here in Hawaii, we are facing issues of not, not of adoption, but of actual connectivity. Much of our state is rural and while internet service exists, is slow, spotty, or unreliable. Some students currently practice the parking lot method for school. What can we do here in Hawaii to change this? Yes, I can, I can take this. Um, and by the way, I grew up in Hilo, Hawaii, and I spent a lot of time on the Hamakua Coast because you know I, my dad's family was a plantation family. Um, I completely get um, the concerns you're talking about, about rural areas. And you know, again, um, this goes back to something I talked about a little bit earlier, you know, there, um, the FCC is directing, uh, has, has directed, you know, something like 20, I want to say 25 billion um, over the, um, over the past several years to address the issue of availability where broadband connections don't exist today. Um, it will be shortly awarding an additional 1.6 billion a year um, in, in a um, reverse auction program coming up. Um, certainly there are areas in Hawaii as well as across the nation that are gonna be eligible for funding through these auctions. Um, so once again, you know, the government is most definitely um, doing everything it can to you know, get broadband to areas that lack a commercial business case for deployment, but you know, again, it's um, you know we're all, the government's sort of handicapped in you know um, funding this very 
important public-private partnership um, because the program, the universal service program, is funded by you know a tax on telecom services. Um, so once again, you know we believe the issue is funding, and you know we're, we urge Congress to um, you know make the funding available to get broadband to areas um, like in Hawaii, you know that, that don't have them today. Well, I think one action point, right, for community members is to raise the awareness of funding for issues such as this and to raise it with your member of Congress and then in turn have her or him amplify their voice so that that but both becomes part of that national discussion about the funding uh, so that's much broader than that whatever it is 25 billion or so but then also your member of Congress even with that 25 billion should be effectively pushing to get their piece of the pot for the rural parts of your community that are represented by her or his district. So that's another piece that certainly, and especially if they are heavy Asian districts, those are the ones that we care about. Uh, so that's another action item that community members could take upon themselves. We've got one, one more question before we wrap up. Um, is broadband access seen as a civil rights issue in your respective industries or provider, particularly for providers, especially for APIs? I think it's starting to a little bit. Um, I'll just kick it off there, so why not? Um, uh, I think it's definitely because of George Floyd and this, you know, the issues with law enforcement, it is starting to be a dialogue during those difficult conversations we've had amongst in our ERGs. So, uh, but it, things definitely needs to be continue. And I think, as I said before, kind of on the flip side is without this kind of connectivity in these underserved communities, none of this stuff would have been exposed in terms of seeing officers shoot unarmed black men and those type of issues. So if they didn't have the connectivity, public would not have seen it. So, so there's the advantage, I mean, there's definitely a need in terms of addressing civil rights as a need for getting that access, but it's also the need in terms of how it can be used to help expose other civil rights issues going on. So, but as I said, it is starting to become part of our difficult conversations. And I think leadership of Verizon is definitely emphasizing the need for the continuing difficult conversations in order so we can actually make systemic change. To piggyback off of what Albert just um, mentioned, you know, yeah, I think we certainly see it as a um, as a matter of civil rights, as a matter of equity and justice, and I think that's a lens that we've been looking at it for some time, because I think as we've talked about some of the numbers and some of the numbers that Beth had mentioned too, that uh, communities of color, especially, have been disproportionately impacted. Um, when it comes to broadband affordability and adoption. So, you know, I think we talked about also the need for more API data, but, you know, just when you think about how Americans subscribe to broadband at home, you know, 73% of Americans subscribe to broadband, 61% of Hispanics, and then 66% of Af African Americans subscribe. So you already see that disparity. So unless we address it, we're not going to be able to fix the problem. And so we do, to a certain extent, do see it from that civil rights lens. And that's why we also work with civil rights organizations to ensure that we're able to, uh, you know, ensure that there's equity in this space. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, there's, if you don't have access at this point, certain communities are going to be left behind. There's so much we have to do on the internet these days. Um, and it, it started even before we, you know, many of us had to work from home and many of us have that privilege to be able to work from home right now. But especially those and even service industries, most jobs you have to apply online now. You go to ask for an application at a restaurant, at a store, and they're going to turn you straight to their online application. So we need to really ensure that no matter your, you know, no matter what community you come from, no matter your income level, that you know we ensure that the internet is the equalizer that we hope that it would be. I would just jump in and say that 
certainly from Microsoft's perspective, I mean, as building on what everybody else has said in, in, in terms of the need for access, the need for equitable access, the need for affordable access, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, we view this as an empowerment issue, right? And so, you know, the mission statement, I won't go through it all, but it's, a, it's essentially about empowering individuals and organizations. And I think this goes back in some ways to um, a question earlier about what can we be doing, whether it's an engineer or a consultant or a government affairs person or community uh, person, whatever, what can we be doing? And part of it is how do we frame the conversation? Um, I think there are definitely ways in which we can frame this as a civil rights issue. And I think John, obviously your organization, other folks on this uh, panel, as well as attendees have been doing that and have, have been beating that drum in, in important ways. There are also ways, frankly, that we can have conversations about just frankly, the, the business interests here, the, the societal interest of, having broadband access. I mean, for small business owners, for entrepreneurs, for doctors, for teachers, you know, people who are engaged in telehealth, people who are, you know, frankly getting, um, you know, the, the use out of the cloud. It's an important piece for anybody and everybody. And so I think there's, depending on your audience, frankly, it, there's ways to, to frame the conversation to try and get everybody on the same page that no matter who you are, as Linda was saying, no matter where you're from, no matter your race, ethnicity, background, socioeconomic status, we all should be having good, you know, accessible, affordable broadband, um, you know, to basically have that as part of our daily lives and not having that really, I think what we're seeing now even more so in this in current crisis is it, it's putting people or leaving people behind and leaving people, you know, on the short end of, of things in this time when people need to be, you know, all kind of coming together as a community. Well, for me, this one's easy, right? <laughs> I mean, it's obvious we think it's a civil rights issue. If, if you think of education as a civil rights issue, technology involve, education involves technology, therefore it's a civil rights issue. You know, employment is a civil rights issue, employment now involves technology, therefore it's a civil rights issue. For us, it's as basic as, as that. And I appreciate how all of our industry leaders are thinking about this as well. Can I just make one more, I'm sorry about that, I know you may be jumping, but just to plug, just to make sure we don't, I know we're running out of time, but to plug what John was saying earlier on in the discussion about there's also a literacy component here, right? There's an education component, there's a digital skilling piece to this. And, and digital skilling is a wide spectrum. I mean, we have initiative to try and get digital skills to 25 million people, but that's a broad, broad spectrum of folks. Some people just need to know how basically to use a computer, how to access the internet, how to you know, get on to the internet in the first place. Other people are trying to use it in apprentice, apprenticeships or other you know, more higher skilled jobs. But you know, that's also you know, an issue around access and equity to those skills and those types of pathways, those learning pathways, if you will. And it's very clear that uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and it's very clear that, you know, efforts to address those digital literacy um, needs because, um, you know, they differ, like you really need to target them to like specific small populations like, you know, some, um, some people may, you know, need like to learn how to keyboard, right, that wasn't something they had to do before or, you know, other people. Um, may need um, information on, you know, how the internet's useful to them, you know, what, how, they, how it can help them get, you know, government benefits or access information about healthcare, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but that's something that really varies from, um, you know, kind of community to community and small group to small group. So this is absolutely a place where, you know, the AAPI community has a really super important role to play, right? Um, yeah, and sorry, Nisha, just wanted to, Chan and Beth make really great points. And, you know, I think for much of our over at Comcast, much of our even community impact giving that we provide really focuses on um, how we are increasing the um, level of digital out there for communities in, in need. If you're not going to, if you're not literate in digital skills today, then you're not going to be able to even understand why you need the internet and why you need to uh, subscribe to it. So, you know, as Beth just pointed out, unless you know how to use a computer, you, you know, I think many populations have figured out how to use a phone, but that doesn't mean that, that those skills actually translate over to using a computer. Right. So I think 
that's really something we could use the help of our community to figure out how we can create more digital learning um, programs or partnerships where you know there's especially a need we um i just figure i just remembered the number of partners that we have when it comes to um you know organizations schools and elected officials that we work with when it comes to ex expanding digital skills throughout the country and it's ten thousand partners so i know we need more aapi partners in that space um so i just really wanted to put the call out to the community to say th think about this as an aspect of your um service to the community it's, you know, whether it's helping seniors, whether it's helping newly arrived immigrants, whether it's helping children, these are critical skills that they're going to need in order to succeed in this country or just succeed in the world today. Yeah, Nisha, I'm going to put a, I'll put a, a link. We have the digital promise we launched that is helping students get um, access to devices and technology, but also the digital skill set and it helps them bring them through the whole process at many different levels. So I'll get that information out to all of you. Awesome. Um, I am in, we're at 315. I'm cutting our one minute of uh, closing or parting thoughts to about 30 seconds for each of you. Um, can, we'll go ahead and start with John. Sure. Actually, mine is unrelated to Tech and Telecom, which is it, this is actually a value that Apex as an organization brings. And it's wonderful to see my fellow panelists because the, all of us actually, we've known each other in many different facets of life. Frankly, the first time I met all, all of them, I think they were in public government sector and I was the private one, right? <laughs> and, and this says something about all the people to all the people watching is think about how you can contribute to our Asian American community through all of your different walks of life, whether it's private, whether it's public, whether it's government, and never feel confined. And then if, as long as you do that, you know, that's being part of our community. Thank you. Albert. Yeah, I, I, no, just to tap on John, I think, yeah, it's great to see everybody here. It feels like a DC reunion again, except without the happy hours, but uh, anyway. Um, but no, I really think this has been a great conversation and I wanna view this as a starting point that we're gonna to continue to check in and progress together and solve this problem as an industry and as organizations overall as a true partnership because the, our community definitely needs the connectivity. There is disparity in how we can do that. The only way we can do that is to do that together between the community, the private and the governmental sector. So let's continue this conversation and make sure this gets done. Thank you. Uh, Linda? I think I jumped the gun when it came to my call out. So I'm just gonna reiterate it. So I would love to see more API partners in the, um, in the realm of helping our communities get connected, the realm of getting them trained up in digital skills. So I really, I, I'm not kidding when I'm saying, please do reach out to me and I'm gonna volunteer the others on this panel if uh, you would like to learn more about what that would look like or how you can help. I really do think it's so critical. And um, as John has heard me complain many times over the years, we need more of our community members to get engaged in this space. Um, and I thank APAX for holding this conversation today. And as Albert mentioned, I hope it's a one of many, but you know, this we're part of the engine that's driving the future. And we certainly don't want to make, you know, see the APAX API community left behind. So I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks. Sean? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I, again, building on what people were saying, I, I would just thank Apex for doing this. Um, my kind of final words just again, get engaged, get involved, support Apex to the extent you can, or support AAJC or both, um, you know, in whatever way, however way you can, get engaged. You know, Microsoft is, is very proud to be supportive of both organizations because there's tremendous work being done on behalf of the API community and we're happy to be part of that. But there's a lot more to be done. There's, you know, a lot more work, a lot more hard work. And I think John and Madeline and others would, you know, welcome any and all assistance that they can get. So thanks. Thanks, John. And we'll wrap up with Beth. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, uh, Representative Meng. Thank you, APAC. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. This is a really great conversation. And um, 
just to echo what everybody else has said, you know, this is this is the beginning, it's not the end, and there'll be many, many conversations to come, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Beth, John, Albert, Linda, and John for, for this panel today. I'm uh, thrilled to have moderated, and with that, uh, thanks to all of you for joining, and I'll turn it back to Madeline. Thank you, Nisha, for facilitating this conversation. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us uh, for this important discussion today and all of the wonderful plugs. I appreciate it. Uh, we want to also thank uh, all of our sponsors on this panel again for all of their support, AT&T, Comcast, NBC Universal, Microsoft, and Verizon. Uh, please join us next week on Thursday, September 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern for the next panel in our legislative leadership series where we are likely to have a dynamic discussion on diversity in sports. APEX will also be conducting legislative leadership series sessions two times a week in September. So feel free to peruse the website for other opportunities to engage in these policy discussions. We'll be talking about veterans in the workforce, voting rights, API women and the fight for gender equity, along with a selection of other topics. And we also invite you to join us for APEX celebration because Asian Prom is going virtual this year. Uh, you can RSVP to, partic to participate in all of these fun and exciting events by visiting the APEX website at www.apex.org. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.